everybody. I should first say thank you for the invitation, of course. It's a pleasure to be here. As you heard, this is an experiment. How long can someone give a decent speech when he just comes out of an airplane from Paris this morning? I will talk about one aspect of our work we are doing, which is on molecular switches at surfaces. And this project is funded by a collaborative research center, which is about 20 projects over the whole Berlin area of chemists, physicists, collaborating on molecular switches. I have to admit that we as physicists still use this rather boring uh, switches of azobenzene, which have been used since many, many decades. Um, but for us, it's a model system to investigate basic processes on surfaces and how to get uh, such molecule switching on surfaces. And uh, I should also mention the Helmholtz Foundation, which is another German research foundation where we get funding for more for the dynamical aspects of our research work. You see here hyperpotential surfaces and a molecule running around this. Okay, so probably the most well-known switching process is in your eye. Without molecular switch, you couldn't see this talk. It's a, a retinal, which is this type of molecule, which undergoes a cis-trans isomerization. For now, you go from this bended state into this straight state here. And when it does so, in the cis state, it's bound to opsin, which is a protein in your eye. And uh, when it goes to the transform, it is detached and the molecule or the protein suddenly starts to be very reactive and starts to um, catalyze the vision process in your eye. So that's one uh, molecular switch. And of course, it's very strong against fatigue. So you can use this switch many, many times until uh, it sort of dies or doesn't work and of course your eye and your body produces this switch all the time. What we are interested in is to get new functionality based on the interaction of molecular switches with surfaces and I said this is a collaborative research effort. Just to give you an idea what are molecular switches, you probably know we have switches which do cis-trans isomerization. So that's from this trans form into the cis form. So you have a huge change of the molecular geometry. You see here the distance or the extension of the molecule becomes much smaller. And you have switches which are ring opening, ring closing switches, um, which open here the pi system, for example, and there is some charge uh, polarization included. And so you see what happens here is a strong change of the uh, dipole moment from 3 to 4 dBi to 15 to 18 dBi in this type of molecules. And the switching processes are usually started by absorption of a photon. You excite the molecule and then it goes into the um, other state. Another example, which I like because it's, I don't think it's very useful, but it's kind of uh, strange what researchers do. This is um, a molecule which is also a ring opening, ring closing molecule called D-C-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-N-E-
you can change the optical properties you may be able to change wetting, de-wetting of the surface, the work function, the surface barrier related to this work function, and then the tra charge transfer across this surface barrier. And there is a nice example of Samori's group, who is in Strasbourg in France. They have built an OFET, so an uh, organic field effect transistor. You probably know that in as compared to conventional electronics you re you'd need really high voltages to make this work so in conventional electronics this would be a volt here you have 80 volts or so which you apply but if you look at the current here through this device so you have a drain and a source this blue is an organic semiconductor these are gold wires you have a gate and you apply a voltage to the gate and you get sort of a diet type of function yeah at minus voltage no current at plus voltage you get a current and uh, now there is a molecular switch integrated uh, in between this uh, contact and the organic layer and if you switch this switch by light indeed the current increases now there are two things I want to say about this. The first thing is this is a very nice example on how you change surface barriers by changing switches. The second thing is you should not believe what you see in comics. Nobody knows if this really looks like this. Yeah, You have really to do hard science to learn whether this is really uh, the scenario at the surface and whether this is really the reason behind this change. This is very very difficult but it works and usually sometimes we use things which simply work and later on we explain why they work. Okay. So when it comes to azobenzene, this cis-trans motion, so here's the cis, here's the trans, is um, a kind of a hula hoop motion. It's a combination of an inversion, so you get from here to there within the plane. Yeah, so you move sort of, if this is the trans, you move within the plane. And the other one would be a torsion, which is harder to show. This would go this way up. And it's actually a combination of these two, what the molecule does, and this is what theory tells you. So you have a mixture of inversion and bending, and the most recent paper calculating this is published here in Chex in 2008. And these are the potential energy surfaces. This is the ground state. You see the trans state is lower in energy than the cis state. There is a barrier in between. So usually if you have the molecules in the cis state and you wait, they just overcome this barrier and you find everything in the trans state. So the stable state is the trans state. Then what you do is you excite with a photon, typically 3.6 electron volts, which happens to be around 360 nanometer. And you excite to a state which is um, the pi, pi star excitation. So from the HOMO minus 1 to the LUMO, which is the pi star. And then this is, state is not stable. It immediately, or more or less immediately, decays into a double excited state, where the Lum HOMO gets excited into the pi star, so an N, non-bonding orbital, doubly excited into the pi star. And then you go along this pathway here to go into the this state. And just if you ask about the time scale on which this happens, so that's now in uh, solution, the time scale for this crossing of these two states is about 0.15 picoseconds, 150 femtoseconds. That's one femtosecond is 14 zeros after the comma and the one and then a second. So it's a very, very short time. Or you could say it's the vibrational period of a molecule is on the order of 100 femtoseconds that you get an idea. Then you need about 450 femtoseconds to come down here and around another two to three picoseconds to go into the state. So all together, um, yeah, the quantum yield, so once you have absorbed a photon or the molecule has absorbed a photon, the quantum yield for this is 0.12. So about every tenth photon that is absorbed brings you into this state. The others are lost somewhere else. The quantum yield from going from this state, which is the cis-excited state, backwards, is 0.25.
So now everybody who has noticed this would say this cannot work because if I shine in light, it's much more likely that I end up here than I end up here. So I never will switch. There must be something in addition. What we remember first is the time scale is very short on the order of a few picoseconds on which this happens. This has to do with the absorption bands, with the optical absorption. So the quantum yield tells you if the photon is absorbed, how likely is it that the molecule goes into the other state. This here is the absorbance now, so this tells you how likely is it that the molecule absorbs. What you do is you vary the photon energy or its wavelengths and you measure the absorbance. So it's a transmission experiment with a UV vis light and we use this switch here which is this azobenzene, there is an alkyl chain attached, never mind. It has an S2 transition and an S3 which is two which are pi pi star transitions and an S1 transition. So this is the pristine molecule in the transform. Now if you shine in with light at um, 365 nanometers, which is around here 3.6 electron volts, so around here, you see the spectrum completely changes. You go into the cis state and this absorption band vanishes here and shifts to higher photon energies. And this is the reason why you don't go back because if you now look at 3.6 EV, the absorption in the trans state is much higher than in the cis state and so you switch only from the trans into the cis. To come back optically into the cis state, or from the cis state, sorry, into the trans state, you look at this here, this is the n pi star transition. You see the n pi star transition is very weak in the black, which is the trans, but it's stronger in the cis state. And the reason is this n pi star state uh, or transition in the trans state, this molecule has inversion symmetry, if you forget about this tail here. So you can divide, and now come the only two German words, the orbitals into gerade und ungerade, and ungerade. So even and odd, which is gerade and ungerade. And uh, then you cannot have a dipole transition from n to pi star because of symmetry reasons. But if you go to the cis state, you break the symmetry and you see this band comes up. So if you shine in now at 2.8 electron volts light, you switch back to the trans state. You see that you, in solution, don't switch back to the full state. You come only to a photostationary state, which is not the thermally relaxed state. So we always reach photostationary states, which means you shine light on, you switch between the two states, and you end in a photostationary equilibrium. So the selectivity on switching comes via the absorption and not the quantum yield. And the cross section in solution is about 10 to the 18 photons per square centimeter, which you have to shine in in order to switch sort of a solution of molecules. Okay, so what is happening on a surface? Well, on a surface, what is happening is charge and energy transfer towards the surface. Now, if you do an excitation of a molecule, for example, yeah, pi pi star transition, then you can either have energy transfer this is decaying back and you excite an electron hole pair in your substrate. If your substrate is a metal, it offers you tons of elect electron hole pairs and this process is very likely. In chemistry between molecules, this is called Förster transfer. Or you have a charge transfer of this electron into the substrate, uh, tunneling simply through this barrier. On which time scales does this occur? Um, if it's ultra fast, then of course it will quench the switching. You have learned that it takes three picoseconds to switch the molecule. If this process is faster, you will not switch or you will have a hard time to switch the molecules. The time scale of electron transport can be measured in various ways. I choose, choose an example to please Louisa, which is um, the core hole clock method. You excite an electron from a core hole into an empty orbital up here, into the LUMO. And then you watch the Auger decay. 
So an electron fills this hole and another electron is kicked out. And you get this green spectrum here. This is actually a true measured spectrum of argon on platinum 111. Now, if you attach your molecule to a surface, what or your atom, what can happen is that this electron tunnels into the metal. Then this electron is no longer here. If now the decays happen, the spectrum you, s you measure looks pretty much the same as the one you measured before, but it's shifted in energy because the electron that was sitting up here was screening this transition, giving it a lower energy here in green, um, as compared if the electron is not there. And this shift is called the spectator shift. So the green component is happening when the electron still sits there, the red component when the electron moves to the substrate. Now on the timing comes now from the lifetime of this core hole. The lifetime, so these are lots of spectra when we tune across this resonance here of this transition. But we can concentrate on this one. Here's the clock. It takes about 5.5 femtoseconds for this to decay and to fill. If you would only get a green part, then everything would um, be still in this state where the electron hasn't tunneled. If you get a red part, the electron has tunneled. So uh, you sort of start the clock and from the area of these two components, you can derive the time, oops, which didn't show up here. And the time is four femtoseconds. So this is an argon atom on a platinum surface. Argon is a rare gas, it doesn't make a binding to the surface, but still it takes only four femtoseconds for an excited electron in the argon to jump into the substrate. If you hear this, you would say, okay, trying to switch a molecule which takes three picoseconds is a crazy idea on the surface. Yeah? So what do you have to do? Either you use a surface which is completely inert, but it's hard to create such surfaces, or you have to do something to your molecules. And there are two ideas. The one is you put lift substitutants on your molecules. So this red one is your switch. And then you put some bulky spaces on your switch which lift, which lift the switch from the surface. Or the other thing would be that you um, chemisorb the molecule, but you have some spacer in between the switch and your surface which works, so to say, as an insulator towards the surface. And in the rest of the talk, we will follow these two strategies. In part one, I will talk about such a situation of a molecule lifted upward by substitutants. And in the second part, I will talk about optical switching in self-assembled monolayers, where we have a sulfur bound to gold and then an alkane chain, which detaches the molecule from the surface. Okay, so the first example is so-called TBI. This is an imine where the one nitrogen atom is replaced by a CH bond, otherwise it's like azobenzene, and there are four butyl groups attached which kind of lift the molecule from the surface. And you know that saturated, unsaturated hydrocarbons are rather inert and help you to detach the molecule and decouple it. This is a quite uh, interesting photograph of our end station. It's done by a student who happens to be an artist uh, and a photographer and he just came to the beam lines making photos of these stations. So he was very fascinated of our end station and he calls this photo series my beam line and he has a vernissage in Berlin where you can now see our beam line, uh, our end station as well. And this was the photo of the invitation to the vernissage and so I took it in order to explain to you what we have. Basically we have a mass spectrometer to do thermal desorption, we have a lead, we have an evaporator at the bottom which is actually movable so you, that you can take it downwards while you bake your UHV system because the molecules in the evaporator would already evaporate when you heat up your chamber. And we have a rotatable analyzer. So this analyzer can be rotated around the axis of the incoming beam, which 
allows you to realize a few geometries in measuring. And one thing that is also very important is a fast shutter um, where we mounted a photodiode. So when we do, for example, scan, when we scan the photon energy, we shoot the shutter in whenever the beam line is moving. And then we shoot the shutter out just for measuring a second and shoot the shutter back in in order to avoid damage by the X-rays of our molecular layers. This is a severe problem. Now we try to decouple molecules from the surface in order to make them switchable. But this also means that any excitation of the molecule is not very well quenched. And this means the molecule can break if you put X-rays on. So you have to be very careful. And this is one part of being very careful. The other part is usually of cooling your system because cooling helps you that parts that or molecules that break apart still stick together and then rebound and nothing happens, so to say. Okay, this is the thermal desorption spectrum of our TBI molecule. Meaning we heat the sample and look at which temperature molecules desorb. If you look first on this one, these are multi-layers coming off at around 300 K. And then there is a region with uh, rather low intensity, which is this one. And you see basically, and this is all what I wanted to show you, three different sub-peaks. And these substructures in the monolayer desorption peak already tell you that there must be some special energetics going on. Yeah? You heat the sample, molecule is coming off. What I forgot to say, which was on the slide before is, these molecules are large. So we have a coverage of 5% only. And here we record the mass 59, which is a cracking pattern of this molecule. And that's the reason why these spectra are rather noisy. Because we have only very few molecules, and then they are also cracking, and we record a cracking pattern. And on top of this, we have to move the sample away from the mass spectrometer because um, the sample should not see the electrons of the mass spectrometer. So this makes this rather noisy. OK, now we go to core level spectroscopy. And I would say this you can only do at the synchrotron. Or it's very tricky because um, the amount of molecules is rather low. And we want to look at the nitrogen. XPS. So we want to detect 5% of a monolayer of nitrogen and less. What we do for this purpose is we look in the direction normal to the surface and align the electric field vector also normal to the surface. This is again a dipole selection rule. If you have a 1s core level, you end up with from 1s, you end up in a p state, delta L1 in the dipole transition. So you have a P wave. And the P wave symmetry is such that it um, has a node parallel to the surface if you put your field vector perpendicular. So you see you have a lot of enhancement in the direction normal. If you would try to measure this in this direction, you would have a problem. You have to measure this normal. This is nice if you are at a synchrotron where you can rotate the polarization of the beam line by an undulator which allows this, or if you have a machine where you can ro rotate your analyzer, then you can measure in this geometry and you get the spectra. Now you may say these spectra are again noisy. Yes, they are. The reason is not that we could not measure this with more statistics. The problem is if you try to measure this with more statistics, you ruin your molecules. Yeah? So you cannot have many scans. But it's still sufficient to see one particular thing, namely that you have two peaks depending on the coverage and temperature. Look at this. This is at 210K absorbed. And we see a state at a binding energy around through 397 or so, 397.6 or so. If we absorb the same thing at 300K, we suddenly have something shifted by one electron volt in binding energy. And as I will tell you later, these are two species one is the trans species at the lower binding energy. Sorry, this is wrong by 1 EV. And um, the other one is at the higher binding energy, the cis species. And that you only reach the cis species at higher temperature tells you that you have to overcome a barrier from the trans to the cis in order to create this cis species, a temperature 
you need to increase the temperature in order to overcome this barrier. So how do we learn that this is cis and trans? For this we apply now NEXAF spectroscopy or X-ray absorption. Basically what you do here is again you ramp your photon energy through the trans unoccupied transitions going from the N1S core hole into these unoccupied states and as a signature of how strong this absorption is you measure the OG electrons coming out as indicated here. You change the geometry once you have the field vector parallel to the surface, once you have the field vector perpendicular. Now we detect this in the so-called OG geometry where we measure always perpendicular to the direction of the field vector which suppresses the direct photo emission and increases the OG yield which helps us to be more sensitive. So, when the field vector become again from S wave, the N1S for example, into P waves. Because this is the dipole transition. When the field vector is aligned perpendicular and we have a pi system which lies flat on our surface, we would see this orbital which makes up a pi orbital. When the field vector would be in plane, we would see this sigma type of orbital made out of the px, py orbitals. Yeah? The core hole transition is a localized transition, that's why you can look at p orbitals instead of or assembling these molecular orbitals. If you now would rotate the molecule by 90 degrees, then the role of the two polarizations would change. And that's what we see as the next thing. We start with a coverage of half a monolayer. We see two transitions which are related to the LUMO and the LUMO plus V. To the right you see a calculation of the orbitals of the free molecule. And these are the first four unoccupied orbitals starting from the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital to the LUMO plus V. And if you look at this you see that only two wave functions have here at this nitrogen edge, this is hard to see, but this is the nitrogen atom, have some uh, density of states at this nitrogen, while the other two lumos don't have. So you see only two, namely this one and this one. And the nice thing of these two is that one is uh, connected to the benzylidine ring, so the one where the carbon is here, the other one is connected to the aniline ring, that's the one where the nitrogen is here. So, in this case, both show the same polarization dependence. Black is high, red is low. This means the molecule is lying flat on the surface. It's a trans molecule. Now, if we increase the coverage and adsorb at 313K, you see that this transition here has a changed um, order of the peaks, the red one is high, the black one is low, meaning this must have rotated. The other one still has this black and red order of the initial one, this has not rotated. So, as we have learned, this here is um, the one that is related to the LUMO, which is this one, which is related to the nitrogen, which is related to the benzylidine ring, what we learn is the benzylidine ring turns around while the aniline ring stays flat on the surface. So this tells us we are coming from the trans into the cis state. You also see a shift of this peak here in energy, which is exactly the shift we have seen in XPS. A shift to higher photon energy means a lower binding energy of the core hole in order to reach the LUMO orbital. If you go to an intermediate coverage, yeah, this one, you see both. You see trans and cis states and you see um, sort of a mixture of a tilted and a flat species. And if you go now to the multi-layer, suddenly you are back at the trans. This is absorbed at low temperatures, the molecule remains flat. There is a theory which exactly confirms this and um, as I want to tell you a little bit about um, photoisomerization, I skip this and just show you one thing. 
Afterwards, we convinced our colleagues that they should do STM, and nowadays people believe much more in STM than in spectroscopy, which makes sometimes it a hard time to sell your data if you don't do STM. What you can learn from the STM here is that this cis molecule, which has this white blob coming out because it's rotated and sticking out of the surface, is always in between these strands, and if it's in between, then the order of these strands changes. You see here the tilt angle changes. If you have two in between, like here for example, the tilt angle doesn't change, which you can see if you go along this row. But what you learn more is that if you have a completely covered surface as here, you can have three cis molecules for two trans, because the cis molecule on rotating needs less space than the trans molecule which lies flat. So what you gain is absorption energy. When you go from the trans to the cis, you can get three cis, you gain the absorption energy from one cis, and you have to put in the barrier for three times this rotation. And here's the barrier calculated from the theoreticians. That's a density functional calculation, which includes van der Waals interactions, which is very important for these large molecules, which also interact via van der Waals forces with the substrate. If you neglect van der Waals forces in these calculations, they are wrong, because they are so strong for these large polarizable molecules that you really have to take them into account. And this is a new development in theory to be capable of um, even including van der Waals interaction, which uh, density functional theory usually does not. So what you learn is that the barrier or the, the energy you need to go from the trans to the cis is 0.4 electron volts. And the chemisorption energy is 3 electron volts. So you gain a lot of energy putting another molecule on top and let the others switch. So this is sort of the end of the story here. Uh, you have different phases and uh, due to the ability of the molecule to switch, you can, depending on coverage and temperature, switch uh, a complete layer between cis and trans. You could toggle between these states, so switch between these states by changing the temperature or by at a fixed gas flux or by changing the gas flux at a fixed temperature. This is of course not what we wanted. We wanted that the molecules switch with light, so we tried to switch the molecules with light, and in none of these layers we could see any switching of the molecules due to light. So it's still only this absorption energy which helps us to switch the molecules, but we cannot switch them by light. And that's why we went on. Of course, this is just a theoretical uh, <laughs> <laughs> movement. Of course, we wanted to study self-assembled monolayers and the optical switching in such layers. A field I'm very, I very much enjoy that is electron dynamics. And I will tell you a little bit about electron dynamics in single component SAMs. And then I will tell you something on how we can tune the composition of these SAMs and uh, thereby tailor the optical properties change the orientation of the molecules, and finally achieve photoisomerization in this mixed self-assembled monolayers. So self-assembled monolayers are in itself nice, because what you do is you use a piece of gold, you throw it in a, into a liquid, usually ethanol, where you have your molecules inside, you wait 24 hours and you have a well-ordered self-assembled monolayer. So no UHV, nothing required just clean chemistry and you end up with a monolayer. <coughs> These are rather stable, you can carry them through air to your experiment. Usually we carry the, them in argon inert atmosphere and in the dark because these are photosensitive, but otherwise that's okay. And we don't use gold of course, we use gold on mica. So mica is very flat, if you evaporate gold on mica you get 111 terraces, perfect. Even with the surface state, the gold surface state on this terrace, so the quality is very good. And there is a small, small company in Germany selling these things, so you even have, don't have to do it yourself. And this is very uh, affordable. You get large pieces of gold on mica. You can cut it with a scissor, 
put it in solution and you have your SAM. So this is uh, very nice, actually. And this makes it also, for practical reasons, maybe interesting. If you look at an STM picture of this, you see that the S these uh, structures cover all the islands. So this is 250 times 250 nanometers, uh, angstroms, quite large. And you get an ordered structure, so you get well-ordered single component SAMs. This was done in St. Andrews in a collaboration which is in Scotland with Manfred Buck, their uh, professor. Um, okay, so that's about the quality. And now again uh, about surface dynamics, I al already explained to you that you can have charge injection and back charge transfer into your substrate and you can have charge injection into the molecule from your surface. And in order to do this, we use femtosecond laser pulses. So we use the first laser pulse which does the excitation and a second laser pulse which kicks out the electron and then we measure the electron in a typical electron analyzer. The energies are rather low, we detect, so you have to take care about screening of fields and so on, but otherwise it's uh, from the electron spectroscopy side straightforward. From the laser side it looks a little bit more fancy, so we have a big laser table. You need a lab where the temperature is stable by half a degree, so I would guess that every student here wants to join such a lab because it's always the same temperature unless the air condition is not working which also happens in Berlin of course but otherwise um, otherwise this is not stable uh, because thermal expansion would already uh, kill your experiment okay this is by the way Christian and Bea preparing the experiment and this was a professional photographer that's why they wear these goggle goggles and the white uh, gloves usually they don't yeah so, and this is the measurement. What we do is we excite, as I said, with one laser pulse at four electron volts, and we use a second laser pulse to probe. You see here the intensity as a function of energy and as a function of the pump probe delay. So you have two pulses, and these two pulses are very short. They have a few, say, 50 femtoseconds, and then you just vary the delay between the first and the second pulse and you follow the population decay. What you see here is you excite, and then even at 80 femtoseconds you still have intensity, though the electron is not gone, but you can still probe this. And if you now uh, just measure the intensity as a function of delay, here at delay zero you get these peaks, and if you go out you get lifetimes of these states. And these are on the order of a few hundred femtoseconds, or of 100 femtoseconds. And I didn't say what this is. This is a molecule, AZ3, that's azobenzene with three carbon atoms as spacer between surface. Sul sulfur atom, three carbon atoms as a spacer. We have an oxygen as a linker and then the azobenzene. And you see even in this molecule, here we excite a resonance of this azobenzene even then, with this spacer, it takes only 80 femtoseconds for the electron to leave the molecule into the substrate. And if you look again at a very nice measurement from Peter Feuner's group, you see here they did this in with the cohole clock technique again for this end as a function of chain length. And if we put our results in, it fits quite nicely that as a length of four, this increases to 100 femtoseconds. As a length of two, it's about 20 femtoseconds. It's a tunnel process. It should go exponentially with the distance. If you increase the distance here by a factor of two, the lifetime increases by two to the square, by a factor of four, which would give you an exponential law. Okay, so this is one thing. And then we asked ourselves now, is this sufficient to switch? Is this sufficient decoupled? And then we tried to put in the right photon energy, 3.6 eV, which is this pi pi star transition of the azobenzene. And what we found is that here the intensity increases simply. And after one hour, the intensity is larger than in the beginning. And this is this intensity increase. 
So now you can say, well, maybe you just destroyed the layer and there is some intensity increasing. So what you can do is, of course, you can heat and see whether this goes back. And this is what happened. We annealed the sample, it came back. We did the process again, we annealed, it came back. We annealed a little bit more, it came a little bit more back and moved up again. So it seems that we can switch these molecules with a laser with lots of photons. We need 20, 10 to the 23 instead of 10 to the 18 photons to switch this. So this is of course not very efficient and this is not what we want. We don't want to have a femtosecond laser to be able to switch molecules. Yeah? You can learn something about the switching process but it's still not efficient. And there are actually two reasons for this. The first one is still this fast charge transfer into the substrate and the second one is that we have a full layer of azobenzenes and so if one azobenzene wants to move it is sterically hindered by its neighbors. So, but in order to show you that you can really increase the lifetime what we did recently is a measurement on a chain length of 12 carbons and you find a state here which is this state here and you see here the time is now 4000 femtoseconds and the state is still there and if we evaluate sorry if we evaluate the lifetime we see that this decays with a lifetime of 7 picoseconds so an electron in front of such a layer lives at least 7 picoseconds which is, should be sufficient to switch molecules. Another nice thing, if you look at this yellow line, which is in the center of this intensity distribution at the end, the intensity distribution is above this and it's shifted by about 30 milliAV. So this time, the energy of the state lowers. And this lower ring must be a polaron. That means this electron here deforms these hydrocarbon chains gains thereby energy and gets stabilized. And this is this reduction in energy. So that's a polaron formation, which is basically a quasi-particle made out of electron and phonons, which gives you polarons. Okay, so in our dream, of course, for the future is to put molecular switches now in a mixed SAM in that way that we can um, use these electrons for chemistry at surfaces and for switching. And so, as time is running very quickly, um, I will first show you that we can indeed mix those SAMs from solution. So here we just use a spacer, which is now this C12 molecule, and this azobenzene functionalized alkane with a chain length of 11 and here you see again an XPA spectrum just measuring the nitrogen and you see A the peak shifts and B the coverage increases. So as a function of the concentration in solution we can adjust the concentration on the surface meaning you put these two molecules in solution you put 24 hours your sample in if you make some choice, you get some certain mixture on your surface. And this only works if the chain length is long enough. So uh, what is happening is we see still a strong deviation from, from ideal mixing so that you get one-to-one -one what you have in solution on your surface. We get a preferential absorption of the azobenzene molecules, that's clear because the van der Waals interaction of mo these molecules is much larger, they want to be on the surface. But what we see here can be explained with the law of mass action. Uh, this red curve is actually a fit using the law of mass action. And what is in there is that the lateral interactions among the same molecules is stronger than in between the molecules. Now you may ask, do, don't you have segregation? Don't the molecules separate? You have C12 on one side and H11 on the other, so you form islands of these molecules. And again we did NEXA spectroscopy, starting with the pure C12 12 layer down here, then absorbing uh, or 
mixing in more and more AZ11 and what you see again is the orientation changes. Here you see red below black, here you see black below red. What is happening is the tilt angle of this molecule changes with concentration. It gets lower so the molecules lie flatter on the SAM when you have more dilution. The azobenzene wants to come down on the flat, lay down on the SAM if it has enough space. If it has little space because of its neighbors, it stands upright. And this is immediately telling you that this must be mixed. Because if you would have islands, you would always have one of these situations and not the other one. Okay, and now comes a very nice technique which is available for 70,000 euro, which is the UV vis spectrum. Um, so what we do is UV vis spectroscopy and what chemists usually do is they do this in transmission. And what we physicists do it, we do it in reflection. This is our SAM and our gold sample. And you see the difference between the gold sample and the gold sample when the SAM is on top. Most of this difference comes from the optical constants which are changed when you have an organic layer on top of your gold. But little still comes from the absorption of the azobenzene. These are these bands. So this increase here is due to this change in electric, in, in, uh, in constants, dielectric constants. These are the absorption bands. This not, these here. You can only measure this if you first measure the gold sample at the position of the sample, take it out, put it into the SAM for 24 hours, put it back on the very same position and measure the second curve with the SAM on top. If you have a different position and a different substrate, this, this uh, difference reflection spectroscopy doesn't work. So the trick is that this sample holder is very rigid in our setup and that we can sort of replace or put the sample in back and forth without changing the position and then we can indeed measure the difference reflection uh, the difference reflection yeah, in reflection geometry and this is very nice because we can now use a real gold substrate or mica substrate and have our real SAMs and measure this reflection and okay I think I dwell on the tutorial part here more. Um, this is the spectrum in solution. And this is the spectrum in the SAM. What you see is that the S2 band is shifted by about 0.5 electron volts. Blue shift means to higher photon energies, while the S3 band is shifted to lower energies by 0.15 electron volts. In addition, you see some vibrational fine structure, very little, but you still see some which you don't see here in the SAM. And the reason for this is the coupling of the molecules. This is like if you form a band structure, it's excitonic coupling. If you excite a molecule in such a SAM and you have the neighbor, you could also have the opposite situation, having the right one excited and the neighbor unexcited. If you combine these two, this is like hydrogen, you get a bonding and an anti-bonding state. We observe only the bo anti-bonding state because in this case, here the, anti the state down here, you would have opposite phases of the dipoles oscillating because of this minus sign in between. So you only see this upper transition and you get this blue shift. So you get this blue shift due to the interaction of um, the excited molecules. And what you form is a so-called excitonic band. And this is an excitonic blue shift. This is called an H aggregate. In the case of the S3, H means the dipoles are parallel to each other and then you know that they repel each other if they are parallel. In an H aggregate, they are oriented like this. So the plus goes to the minus here. And this is attractive. And so this shifts to the other direction. 
So these are the H aggregates, these are so-called J aggregates here. And this explains the peak shift we observe. Okay. Now if we tune the coverage of our AZ11 azobenzene switch in this SAM, we find that there is a shift of this S2 band which increases linearly with coverage. So we tune the optical properties and you see sort of how you form a band in this um, excited molecular layers. Okay, now finally I want to show you photo switching in reflectance. This is now a 50% SAM where we have 50% AZ11 so only every second molecule is replaced by a spacer in between and you shine in with light you see how the optical absorption band goes away and you shine in light again, blue light and you see how it comes back so this layer we can now really switch back and forth by light and not to end with something so for a long time we worked at the synchrotron to see switching we went to the synchrotron, we thought okay do next spectroscopy, let's see switching this was the 100% SAM, this is the diluted SAM now we know that we can switch this diluted SAM by UV with spectroscopy. This is 20% of AZ11. If we illuminate this one, you see a very tiny change, which you wouldn't believe. Yeah? If you see this, you would say, oh, does this change at all? You have really to go to high resolution, only look at this peak and measure the next one in the photostationary state and you see that the peak is clearly switched if you say this is still as a component in you can say that you switch about half of all the molecules with this core level spectroscopy technique but now comes the clue we always try to do this illuminating outside then bringing the sample into the vacuum and we never saw switching this switching only happens when you illuminate your sample and you leave it illuminated because we can now tune to this photon energy and just measure the intensity here as a function of illumination if you illuminate with UV light it increases you switch to this yellow peak then we take the light off you see that it decreases again and it decreases thermally it switches thermally back on a time scale of a few minutes in outside in the ambient condition these layers these layers are stable for hours if you put them in vacuum they switch back in a few minutes this means that the water layer on top of the molecular switches you have under ambient condition stabilizes the this state and in vacuum it doesn't and we hunted for this result I think two PhD generations because we were always measuring without having illumination while measuring and now you see um, why sort of what, what the vacuum does it takes away the water layer and this destabilizes the cis layer okay what I try to show you in the second part is that we can have desired concentrations of azobenzene and spacers that with the dilution we uh, change the orientation of the chromophore which also means that we really have mixed stems that we thereby tune the absorption spectrum having this excitonic shift that we can switch these and that there is an influence of a water layer most likely on the stability of this cis isomer so with this I want to close thank you for your attention and these are the people who are involved in the work. So this is my group at FU Berlin. This is Cornelius Gahl, who is a postdoc researcher. Um, Wipke Bronsch, Thomas Moll, Daniel Brete, and Daniel Pujembel, who are listed here, um, who did this work. Thank you for your attention.